stitching on paper. It's a beautiful detail to add to your paper craft projects, but it can be tricky and quite overwhelming if you haven't tried it before. If you'd love to add stitching to your cards, scrapbook layouts or journals, and you're not sure where to start, this video is especially for you. It's my ultimate guide for how to stitch on paper like a pro. These tips work on all kinds of projects from cards to scrapbook layouts. I'll show you exactly how I do it on my projects, including my machine settings. Oh yes, and I'll share with you the one big mistake that you'll want to avoid. There's loads to share today. It's time to get started. First up, I want to show you my machine. This one came to me second hand and is a Janome Memorycraft 4000. I use this one only for paper and would recommend that you have a dedicated machine just for paper craft if you can. In the very least, you will need separate needles and thread. I'll get to those in a moment. Every sewing machine is different and it does take a little bit of time to get to know your machine and learn where everything is. I do get asked a lot what the best sewing machine is for paper crafting and the reality is that there isn't one. My biggest tip, you don't need anything too fancy, especially if you're only planning on stitching on paper. I personally prefer a very simple machine, one that has a few standard stitches. I am very fond of the brand Janome, and I've had a Janome for many, many years now, and it has worked flawlessly. Models do vary from country to country, so I will leave some links to my favorites, models that I would be looking at if I was to ever replace my current machine. Here's a closer look at my Janome machine and the settings that I use. I also found this very handy diagram, and I'm sure that many of the major brands would have something similar. It would be well worthwhile checking their website or blog for extra information and details on your particular machine. Here's a look at my machine. As you can see, it is not new. It was actually secondhand to me. So it's several years old now, so much so that you couldn't buy one exactly the same. Um, they do still make a similar model though. Uh, and it has everything that an ordinary sewing machine has. Important note, uh, this is my tension control up here. It's just a button that you sort of um, move that way. And I have it on three. That's what I use for most of my paper craft projects. I also have settings here for stitch length and then stitch width. And I do have a few different stitches that I can choose from. Essentially though, I really only ever use the straight stitch and the zigzag stitch. So make sure that those are included. I can't think of many sewing machines that that wouldn't be included on, but check for that. This button here is very handy. It's a speed adjustment uh, button, and it's actually linked to the foot pedal on the machine. So when you're stitching paper, you do tend to stitch a bit slower. So as you can see, I have it set a little bit on the slower side rather than the faster side. That's handy, not really necessary, but good to have. I do also have storage. So this little foot part does come off the machine, but I do prefer to work with it in place. And I do have a little storage compartment here. It holds um, things like scissors and extra rolls of um, thread. It also holds my needle um, threaders. I love these. I will link them below. So I do like to stitch with this extra part in place. I like the extra room that it gives um, the paper to rest on as I'm stitching. And this washi tape piece, I'll get to that as we get on in the video. That's there for a reason. On my machine too, there's a little guide on the bobbin cover, which shows you how to thread the bobbin, which is super, super handy. So if I was going to nitpick, I would try and choose a machine that has some guides on it for you. So you don't have to keep checking the book every time you have to rethread your machine. 
So as you can see, it is a pretty simple machine. I like it that way. Any machine will sew on your paper. So find something that is simple and easy to use and you don't have to spend a fortune on it. Once you have your machine, you'll only need two more basic supplies to get started and they are needles and thread. I'll be sure to link the ones I use below because I think this is what makes all the difference. You really could use any sewing machine, but you do need the right needle and thread to get a similar look to mine. And here's exactly what I use. This is my most favorite thread. It is much thicker than regular thread and it's most commonly used for stitching jeans. It's called Top Stitch Thread and it's by a brand called Gutemann. Gutemann, Gutemann. It is a little more expensive than regular thread, but it is stronger and thicker and it's that thickness that adds this beautiful quality to your stitch projects. It's the thickness that makes the difference. I do only use this thread in the top section of my machine. For the bobbin, I'll go with a plain regular cotton thread. Just be sure to color match the bobbin thread to the one that you're using. I use a needle that is best suited for denim and tightly woven materials. Ideally, something between size 80 so I think that's a 12 US and 110 and that's a 16 US. These needles have a very strong shaft and a super sharp point. They're used for stitching denim and canvas and tightly woven fabrics and they're ideal when stitching lots of fabric layers together. So they are perfect for paper craft projects. You only ever need to change the needle if it gets blunt or if it breaks. I tend to replace mine around the 12 to 15 month mark but of course it will depend on just how much sewing you're doing and the kinds of projects you're making. Not sure when to replace your needle? As soon as it becomes dull. A dull needle will make a dull sound as it is stitching through the paper, almost like a knocking. You can also check your needle under a magnifying glass or place it against your finger to test how sharp it is. Just be careful when doing that. The needles that I currently have in my machine are these ones here. They are a number 100 or US 16. To make sure the needle fits your machine, you are best going with a branded version. So if you have a Janome machine, buy the Janome needles. There are universal needles on the market as well, but be sure to check your warranty, especially if your machine is new, because using a universal branded product may void it. It is super important to match your needle to your thread, which is why I've recommended this type with the thread that I'm using. I know this is a lot of information all in one video, so I would recommend you clicking the three little dots down on the right there and then choosing save. That way you can reference this video later. I get asked a lot what the difference is between stitching on paper and stitching on fabric. And I think the answer might surprise you because it's not as different as you might think. Any machine will stitch on fabric and paper. You can use any needles and any thread. I just wouldn't recommend that. What I'm recommending is what I've been doing for many, many years. I think stitching on paper and fabric is really similar. And in fact, I think stitching on paper is easier than fabric. I would much prefer to stitch on paper because of the way that it sits in the machine. It tends not to move around in the same way that fabric does. Stitching on paper will not hurt your machine if done correctly. There are a few things to keep in mind though. So here are my top tips. Tip number one is to plan your stitching path. You do need to think about the direction of your stitches, especially when working with a 12 by 12 layout. And that's because the layout itself will not fit between the needle and the machine. 
and you can't fold your page in the same way that you would fold fabric. Let me show you exactly what I mean. I've pulled out a few layouts here to show you what I mean by stitching path. So a 12 by 12 inch layout or a large card won't fit in this space here. If it was fabric, we'd be able to very easily bunch this up and it wouldn't be a problem. We could stitch over here, no problem. But paper, you can't do that with. So when you're adding your stitching, you need to plan out where the stitching's going to go. So if I was going to stitch, say, this stitch here, I know that I can't put the paper in this way. What I have to do is turn it around and stitch it this way because that means that the bulk of the layout will stay outside of the machine and not in here. So I would start stitching this way and then down and then down and even halfway fits, no problem, but I couldn't keep going. Like you can bend the layout up a little bit here and I have done that in the past, but you wanna avoid that because that could damage your background. So from this point on, I would have to turn the layout around and stitch this way, down, down, down. Hope that makes sense. Let's talk about circles. So circles are a little bit tricky because the entire layout does need to go through this gap. The best way I have found to do it is to fold up the edge just a little bit. So when you're working around this way, when you get to here, I do need to fold this edge up just a little bit. Try not to bend it, try to just wrap it around and then around I go. And same with here, it needs going up a little bit more. And this is what you need to think about when you're planning your stitching circle, or sorry, even any stitching path, not just circles. You need to make sure that what you wanna do is able to be done within the space here. And you wanna always make sure that you're stitching so that the bulk of the layout is in this direction. So you wanna stitch here, not here. Tip number two is to start slow. It's a great way to see if your machine is going to do well with the thickness that you are stitching and to check how your needle's going. Overall, I do tend to stitch much more slowly on paper than I do with fabric. Tip number three, if you're working on a project that will end up being very thick, sew in layers. Add stitching in layers as you go and then glue the layers together. You still get the look of a stitched project without the risk of damaging your needle or machine. Tip number four is to let the paper feed automatically. You should not have to push or force the paper through the machine. It should feed through all by itself. Creating a straight stitch should need very little input from you. Let the machine do the work for you. Tip number five. When stitching on fabric, the guides on your machine are very easy to use and see. But quite often, when you change to stitching on paper, those guides are covered up. That's where the washi tape that I mentioned earlier comes in handy. Add a strip anywhere along the arm of the sewing machine and you now have a guide for your paper. If you want to create very straight lines on your projects, this tip is a must try. Let me show you how it works. Let's talk about this washi tape strip here. If I was stitching the edge of my paper, I have a guide. So it's very easy for me to keep the paper straight. If, however, I wanted to create a straight line, say here, here, I can't see the guide. But what I do have now with this washi tape that I placed is I've got my own guide that I've now created that extends this way onto the machine. And in fact, if I wanted to go even further across, all I would need to do is find the end of the washi tape. That's the hardest part. Yeah. I try and line it up with a line that I know is square, like this must be square, right? And then I'll just place it there like that. And now I have a guide here for my line. 
You don't always need this if your pattern paper has a print on it. Sometimes you can use the print as a guide, but if you're working with plain cardstock, you need something to line up the edge of your paper with to create a straight line. So all I do is position the paper where I want to start. Actually, let's use this one so I'm not using up so much paper. Again, I put the needle down and then you just stitch like so all the way along and all I'm doing is lining up that paper with this line here. And then when I'm done, I can pull that out, cut my threads and I've got a straight line. Tip number six, if you ever get any sticky residue on your needle, maybe from say tape or glue, you need to remove it immediately. It can do a lot of damage to your machine. Easily clean it off with a residue eraser. These work exactly the same way as a pencil eraser and I'll leave a link to one below. Tip number seven, to secure your stitches, you can sew back and forth to lock everything in place, or you can pull your threads through to the back of your project and secure them with washi tape. I use a mixture of both of these methods. Let me show you exactly how I go about it. There are a couple of ways you can deal with starting and ending the stitching. So this is the simplest way. I'm just going to pop the paper into the machine. I do like to wind the needle down and start with the needle in the down position. I don't know why I do it that way. That's just how I do it. And then I'm just going to stitch. And as you can see, it doesn't actually need a lot of feedback from me to, to sew straight. It just stays straight. So when I'm finished stitching, I'm just going to stop and then I'm going to pull the paper out at that point. Then I have some threads that I need to deal with here. What I'm going to do is turn the paper over and then gently, gently pull on this thread. And what happens, it's a bit hard to see, but there's a little bit of the thread from the front that comes through to the back. And then what I can do is grab that with my nail and just pull that thread through to the back. So now there's nothing on the front. See how this one's got one on the front? So if you just very gently pull this one at the back, it then loosens that thread from the front and you can very gently, not putting very much pressure at all on there, you can very gently tease that thread through to the back. And then you have no threads at the front and all of your threads are at the back of the paper. And from there, all I do is add tape. So either washi tape or double-sided tape. And in fact, double-sided tape's great if you are going to then add this to something else. So you'll need the double-sided tape on the back anyway. The other way you can do it is to go back and forth. So when you're starting, you start with the needle down again, like I always do, but then you go forward three stitches. And then this is my reverse button here. And then reverse three stitches. And then you can let it go again and it'll go forward again. And you can do the exact same thing on the end. Reverse for three stitches, go forward for, for a few stitches. Then, when you pull it out, it does look different. See how you've got those extra bits of stitching at the front and at the end? I like that look and I do it this way for most of my frames. But then when I add stitching detail within the layout itself, I prefer to use this method. Tip number eight, worried about your papers moving as you stitch through them? You can secure them before stitching with tape. Just be sure to add the tape down the center of the papers well away from your stitching zone. That is the one big mistake you don't want to make. Adding glue anywhere near where you will be stitching is trouble. It's even worse than taking your husband to the craft store. Avoid it at all costs. You'll also want to make sure that any liquid glue is completely dry. Damp paper will tear as it goes through your machine. 
Tip number nine is to remember that your first attempts will not be perfect. It's okay to stitch a little bit crooked. And in fact, as you get better at stitching, you'll be adding back in some of this imperfection and this handmade feel. You aren't sewing for New York Fashion Week, so perfectly imperfect is what we're going for. I stitch on almost every project I make. So if this is something that you would like to add to your paper crafts, now would be a great time to subscribe if you're not already, so you don't miss any future videos, tips, tricks, and ideas. Next up, my top tips for stitching on thick cardstock and chipboard. Tip number one is to avoid it if you can. It's so much better to stitch in layers and then add those layers with glue to your chipboard. You'll still get the look of stitching on your project without the risk of damage to your machine or needles. Tip number two is to loosen the machine tension. I generally run my tension around a number three, but if I am working on a particularly thick project, I will increase it to four. As you get more experience with your machine, you'll learn what settings are best, but generally speaking, I would increase your tension by one when working with thick chipboard and cardstock. Tip number three is to work with a new needle. Now's the time for something really sharp. Tip number four is to work slowly. Imagine yourself a tortoise, slow and steady. Tip number five is to pay attention to your machine. If it starts laboring or struggling, it's making any kind of weird noises, stop immediately and go back to tip number one. I do want to share with you some project examples and we will get to those in a moment. First though, I got a lot of questions when I first mentioned making this video and I want to make sure that I cover them all. So for the things that I haven't answered already, I thought it would be fun to do a quick Q&A round. So I have my questions here. Crystal asked, what are the sewing trends for pages? So sewing itself is a trend and I am seeing a lot of the basic stitches. So straight stitch and zigzag stitch on lots and lots of different paper craft projects. I'm here for it. I am loving it. I'm seeing a lot of perfectly imperfect stitching. So if you're sitting there going, I'm not the best sewer, my stitches need to be perfect. Actually, they don't. I've noticed that the more decorative stitches aren't as popular, which is great because we can keep things really simple. I've also noticed that the threads, people are leaving the threads long and I do personally love that look. Gloria asked, any recommendations for a sewing machine? I've looked at a few, but not sure what to look for if the primary purpose is for sewing paper. Simple, go with a machine that is very, very simple. The minimum you need is something that will do a straight stitch, a zigzag stitch, something that allows you to change tension, stitch length. And if you want to get a little bit fancier, some of the machines allow you to change the speed in which the machine sews, that's handy. Other than that, that's all you need, that will work. It could be a second hand machine like the one I have, it could be a brand new model. Any machine will stitch on paper. Maxine asked, do I need a modern machine or can I use an old one? Maxine, you can use any machine at all. Seriously, the machine is not the, the big deal. Any machine will work. The big deal in my opinion is the needle and the thread. She also asked, will basic stitches sew and not tear the paper? So yes, so basic stitches can tear the paper if you have your settings, if the stitches are set very close together. So you do want to set a straight stitch that's a medium to a longer length because essentially the needle punching through the paper is like creating a perforation. So when that perforation is really close together, if your stitch is really, really short, 
the risk of the paper tearing is greater. So go with a medium to longer straight stitch. Jamie asked how to keep your paper needles stored and separate. So yes, I have two storage places for my sewing things. One is within my machine, which I showed you earlier. That's for all the things I use every single time I sew. I do also have a sewing box and that's where I have like my extra thread and my needles. I know which needles are for which. So what I, but if you don't, that's, that's fine. Um, what I would recommend is maybe just getting a Dymo label up and label them paper. Um, even just something as simple as that or keep your paper needles in a separate section within your sewing kit and label that section paper supplies. Um, you will get to learn and you will get to know, I promise. Sandy asks how to use metallic thread and if using metallic thread, what thread to put in the bobbin? Okay, so metallic thread is a little bit tricky. I would not recommend it if you are brand new to stitching on paper. Save that for another day. If you've got a little bit of experience with regular thread and you want to try metallic, there's a couple of things that you really do need to keep in mind. Metallic thread doesn't behave in the same way that regular thread does. It's a little bit stiffer. And as such, there can be some problems with it when it goes through the needle. And I found that Sometimes the fibers on the metallic thread kind of come loose and can get caught up in the needle a little bit. So you do have to go really, really slowly. You also have to be very prepared to stop and start a little bit because you can be halfway through your like stitching, say around the edge of a layout and the needle can get caught up and you have to stop the machine. You have to re-thread the needle and start over. It is a bit of a test of patience, metallic thread. I do use the Gutemann, Gutemann, Gutemann brand. Um, and I really have actually only used gold and silver. So maybe different brands might be better. I actually haven't tried that. I just know how good this one is for regular thread and I've just stuck with what I know. I would also recommend keeping to either a straight stitch or a zigzag stitch because of the problems that I've mentioned with the needle. You don't want to be halfway through something really complicated because it's really hard to restart and continue the pattern. Much easier to restart a straight stitch. As for the bobbin, I use just cotton thread, plain, the same thread that I use for the top stitch, plain cotton thread in a matching color. Maybe even get away with white, I feel, for a gold and silver metallic thread. Give it a try. To be honest, I don't actually use a lot of metallics in my stitching because they're a lot of fuss um, and I just like to keep things simple. Larissa asked, what is the heaviest weight cardstock I can safely stitch through? Well, that does depend on your machine and will require a little bit of trial and error. I would start with a super thick cardstock and if it's doing okay with that, you could move to a lightweight chipboard. If it's doing okay with that, go to a medium weight chipboard, but do not go past that. A medium weight chipboard is the thickest I would try stitching through. And yeah, so I would trial and error. Trial and error is your friend. Go gently, listen to your machine. Don't force anything. Your machine will let you know what its capacity is. Amanda asked for some tips on curves and circles. Yes, so my top tips for you, Amanda, are start big. So if you aren't really practiced at circles, the larger ones are so much easier to sew than smaller ones. So start big, practice until you get a little bit better and then move to the smaller ones. I find that drawing the circle in pencil is best really lightly in pencil and then just using that pencil as a guide and a line to, to stitch around. Also, keep your stitch length short. So before when I was saying to keep your stitch length longer to stop any perforation problems, circles is the exception to that rule because especially when you're working with smaller circles, you need the shorter stitch length to make that curve. Lucky last, 
Shannon asks, are those little sewing machines made for stitching worth it? I'm not entirely sure which little machines made for stitching she means, but I have a feeling she means the handheld ones. I have seen them quite a lot and my very definitive answer is no. No, they are not worth it. It's only a little bit extra to get a very, very basic freestanding machine. And I would grab one of those in a lifetime over the handheld versions. So do, I know budgets can be tricky. So definitely try to get the best machine you can for the money that you have available to you. Um, and yeah, any of those little handy dandy dinky little machines, no, just even if it means you have to wait another six months or, or more to get a proper machine, it's well worth the wait. Okay, so that's all the technical things covered. I've answered all the questions that I had. I think it's now time for me to show you some examples, some of my favorite stitched projects. So most of these examples will have a stitched border. I do this an awful lot for my pages. I really love the look of that. So I won't be mentioning that every time. I'll just be showing you the extra stitching details that I've included. And for this layout, it's these border strips. So this is a cut file and I have just added a single line of stitching along the top edge of each of the banner pieces. This is very, very simple to do because it's just one straight line. I've also added stitching to my photo for this page and I do that a lot as well. Uh, again, it's just a detail that I love. I love the extra texture that that stitched element adds and I feel like it ties the page together when you have the stitched border, the stitched photo and then another element of stitching. This layout is very similar. Again, I have a cut file in the background and I have just chosen the top edge of these banner pieces to run straight across. So it's a straight stitch, very, very simple, but adds a lot of extra detail. For this next layout, I have again added stitching to the background and it's part of this grid pattern here. So this is a bunch of punched out square paper scraps and I have stacked them all together to create a grid. Now to add extra detail to that grid, I have done a straight stitch down the center of each of the squares and then another straight stitch all the way along this way down the center of each square. So I kind of wanted to recreate the look of a quilt. I love how this page turned out. I love that I can use up those paper scraps and create a really pretty background detail. And the stitching really does add to that feel of a quilt. For this next layout, I wanted to share with you a technique for adding acetate to your page. I've used my stitches to do that and it's a great way to do it because you don't have to worry about the glue showing through. You're actually avoiding glue altogether. So I've got the stitches running right through the acetate pieces and here you can see the stitches actually go through this puffy sticker. I actually really, really love the look of that. It's going through the puffy sticker here as well. And it's just, it just adds such a beautiful texture. So if you ever need to add acetate to your page, stitching's a really good way to do it. For this layout, I have added my stitching on my photos and that was pre-planned. I did not plan, however, to add the stitching to these other elements. So it needed to be added after the page was assembled. And you can do that. You'll see that the stitching ends here. I didn't want to stitch over this chipboard piece, so I've just started it from here and gone around to this point here. Same with here, you can see it does not go underneath that element there. It's because it was added after all of these pieces were in place. So if you want to add stitching to an existing project, you can. You just need to plan your stitching path and be mindful about these raised elements. Here's another example of stitching on a cut file. I have loads of straight edges here. So I have gone around all of them. 
next up we have some curves. I wanted to show you this layout for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I am doing the arches of the rainbow. So this is a curve shape and it's the first circular shape that I'm sharing. And I also wanted to show you this. See how imperfectly perfect this is, especially that bit there. It's a little bit wonky and I am totally fine with that. You need to be. You need to just embrace the imperfection because it is part of the process. I've added the stitching after I fully backed the cut file. So I wasn't going to redo all that hard work just because of a little hiccup in the stitching. I think it really adds character and it adds to that handmade feel of the project. This is not assembled by a machine, it's assembled by an imperfect person. Here's another quick example of circles, but I have actually avoided the whole circular element altogether. These circles are quite small and they would be quite tricky to stitch around. So instead of going around each of the circles to add my stitching, I have just gone with a straight line across the center of each of them. So here's another example of a grid and that quilt-like design. This one is a little different because the squares are larger and they do have spaces in between them. I've arranged them more like a grid and I've added them flat to the background of the page. I've then gone ahead and added that stitch detail. I really feel like in this case, because it's got those spaces there, it helps it all feel more put together and it kind of creates more of the look of a solid piece of paper because they are all joined without having to be joined. Some more textural elements that I've added into the background. So I do have the stitched line that runs all the way through each of the pattern paper strips here. So what I've done here is enhance the print of the pattern paper that's already there. And that's a really lovely way to add stitch detail. If you're not sure where to add your stitching, let your pattern paper be a guide. For this layout, I let the cut file be my guide and I've added the lines within the constraints of the cut file design. Again, they're just straight lines, very, very simple to do, but they do add an extra element to your page. Each section has a stitched line that is part of it, and I have stopped the stitching to keep it within the lines of the cut file. For this layout, I've used the stitching to enhance my stenciling. So this is a sunburst stencil in the background of my layout, and in between each sunburst, I've added a stitched line. So again, I'm working with what I have. It's a similar idea to the past two pages, using the pattern paper or using the cut file, or in this case, using the mask to help you identify where you should add your stitching. I love the extra detail that the stitching adds to the background of this layout, and I feel like it helps to clarify the design of the stencil. I feel like it makes the stencil design a little bit clearer. Here's another example of a circle. For this one, I drew the circle in pencil onto my background first. Then I added my stitching. And can you see my little secret trick here? Because my circle was not perfect, I actually kept going. And I've gone around the circle maybe three times and I have then purposefully made it a little bit wonky in sections. So I've tried to keep it as neat as possible, but where I did go a little bit wonky, I've added more wonkiness to it to make it look like it's there on purpose. You can see down the side here too, I've done some strips of pattern paper and then added stitching just to the top of those pieces. So these pieces actually can lift up creates a beautiful texture. Circles are tricky, so they do need a little bit more practice than your straight lines. Here's a similar idea, but using straight lines. For this layout, I actually created this square in the background first, 
and then used this square element and mirrored it with my chipboard frames. So that's a really nice idea too. And this page would be easier to create than the circle one. I have to include a background shaker in my examples. This is a page that has sequins all in the background here. I don't know whether you can see them there. And to create the pocket, I've used stitching around the edge. I've also added stitching on this one to secure my puffy sticker title. I really love the look of that. So you can create shaker pockets for your projects with a stitched edge. It's one of the most fun ways to create a shaker pocket and I do this all the time. Here's another shaker pocket, but this one is actually secured inside the confines of the cut file. I've cut it out really, really large and then sectioned it off with some vellum and the stitching and secured the gold sequins inside each section. Really, really fun page to put together. And this stitching detail is again, just going around these edge elements. Here's some more perfectly imperfect stitching. If you look at my pages and think that my stitching is always perfect, I'm here to tell you it is not. This is the last layout I want to share with you. Next up, we'll get to some mini albums. I needed to include this one though, because it has a fully stitched background. Every line on this page is stitched. It is a cut file and I wanted it to look almost like ice because uh, we were in Canada on a family holiday way back then. And it's a really special photo and I wanted to go a little bit extra for the layout. So I did take the time to add stitching to the entire background. It took such a long time, but I really, really love how that page turned out. Here's a quick look at some mini albums that I've made, and I have included a lot of stitching. You can see all the stitching there. They all have so much stitching in them, and I think that just makes them. They're just super, super pretty. So I did stitch around the entire um, cover. So this is on like a um, film, a plastic film that you would put in an overhead projector. And then I've added the paper layer on top and stitched around each section. I've also added stitching to secure the closure here. And then a bunch of stitched elements within each mini album. So there's lots of um, fabric and paper stitching that I've added here. And I, I just, I feel like it makes it, I don't feel like these albums would look nearly as amazing if they didn't have all of this stitching texture and extra elements. The key thing here is that I have done all of this stitching in layers. So if there's anywhere in the album that is getting a bit bulky, I will stitch that separately and then glue it on. So some of this is faux stitching and some of it is actual stitching. So these pieces, that stitching does not go all the way through. That stitching is just on that pink piece of paper here. So it's just on this piece here. And then that piece is glued with wet glue onto the page. So that's a really good tip. Make sure that you're doing that. You don't need to stitch all the way through everything all the time. I'll do a quick flip through this last one here so you can see all of this. And see, see here, I've actually made that messy on purpose. That's what I was saying before. When you get really good at stitching, you end up having to add back in the imperfection, which is funny. So that's that one. And there is a video tutorial on these. So if you're looking to make something just like these, I'll leave a link to that below. This is a mini album that I've made. This one's tiny. And I've really just added the stitching down each side of the um, album here. Not a lot, but a little bit just to add a little bit of detail. So you can work on very small projects as well. Here's a look at a tag album that I've created. This one I made before I started the YouTube channel, so there isn't a tutorial for it yet. Uh, so it's just a bunch of tags essentially, and I've added stitching details to each of them. This one is a little pocket, so it's all secured along the edges with that stitching. 
I then have some crepe paper elements that has the stitching added down the end, another little pocket for the photo and some sequins in the back of that one. As we go on into the album, the pages get a little bit bigger, but the principle stays the same. So it's a little plastic pocket with my photo and then shaker elements on the back. This is a little fold out section. So it folds out and I've actually stitched this in place. So you can see the stitching there. And then there's a bunch of photos from our trip. This is our trip to Disneyland with my daughter. So there's that. And then more photos and stitched elements for the title here. And then more shakers. And yeah, so and so on and so forth. Really love a shaker. There's just something, something fun about them. This is a little pocket that has a photo that comes out. And then the two last pages are two big pockets for photos. So for this project, I have stitched through plastic and paper. Perfectly fine, it turned out great. I'd really love to make a, another mini album like this one. It was really fun, I might do that. There you have it, everything you need to stitch like a pro. It's now up to you to go and test out all of these tips and tricks. Not sure what to watch next? Try this video right here. I'll see you all again very, very soon. Until then, bye.